Hello and good afternoon. Thank you for attending this event with Doug Tallamy. Um, my name is Marie Spatel. I'm with Friends of Holland Hills, and we are a 501c3. Um, our, Holland Hills, if you don't know, is a neighborhood not too far from here. Uh, our mission is to preserve, enhance, and educate uh, the public about our mid-century modern neighborhood. Uh, we have 31 acres of public parkland, and a lot of our work has been focused on invasive removal and the promotion of native plants in public parks and in homeowner, homeowners' private yards. So thank you for attending this event. Uh, our supporters, we have nonprofits outside uh, represented and organizations that have helped market this event. Some of these organizations include Plant Nova Natives, Audubon, Audubon Society of Northern Virginia, Wild Ones Nova Seedling Chapter, Virginia Native Plant Society, Virginia Department of Forestry, Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia, American Horticultural Society, and Nature Forward. Um, so I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker in a minute. He will be doing Q&A after the lecture, and we have two microphones on either side of the room. So either you can uh, make your way to a microphone or raise your hand, and we'll bring you the uh, microphone. So uh, Doug has maybe promised to keep his introductions uh, short. So I'll just say he is the T.A. Baker Professor of Agriculture at the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. Um, he is an author of several books, <laughs> author of several books, which I'm sure you have uh, seen on display outside. Uh, and his chief research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how those interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. Welcome. I always tell introducers, just say, here's Doug. And somebody actually did that once. You know. um, I can't believe you guys got to drink wine this whole time. You know, <laughs> just save one. That would be good. Uh, okay. Um, nature's best hope. I'll give you a spoiler. You're nature's best hope. Are you going to recite this for me? You already know this. Yeah. It's just like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Remember that? <laughs> All right. Before we talk about that, though, somebody here must maybe hasn't heard this before, so I'll talk to you. You know, E.O. Wilson died the day after Christmas two years ago. He had a very long career at Harvard. Um, he was 93 when he died, and I think he was writing a book when he died. Um, but one of the things that was consistent throughout his very long career was his love for life on Earth. He loved biodiversity. He fought his entire career to save it, not just because he loved it, but because he knew it was essential to our own survival. So in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life, and his message was very clear. Uh, if we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, we have to save nature. We have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of planet Earth. And he spent most of the book talking about the, the science that supports that, that very bold statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't spend a lot of time telling us how we were going to save nature on half of planet Earth. But to a conservation biologist, that is good news. We'll just put half the Earth aside, and all the things that are disappearing, we can go to that half, and it'll be great. Uh, the problem is half of terrestrial Earth is already in some form of agriculture. And we've got 8 billion people and all of our airports and roadways and detritus in the other half, and we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So how could we actually do this? It's basically what I want to talk about today. I think we can realize E.O. Wilson's dream, but we need a new approach to conservation to do that. Before we talk about that, though, let's talk about what happened in 2019 at a very large oak mast. Members of the Red Oak Group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time, and that's what it looked like in a lot of places. I'm easily entertained, <laughs> so I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it, and I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn, first chewed a little hole for its head, then it forced its head through there, then it forced its entire body through that little hole. It was a tight squeeze. Finally, when it plops down, that's a dangerous sign for that insect larva because it's good to eat. A lot of things are, are after it, so it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface in about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and, and makes a chamber. And within that chamber, it converts itself to a pupa. And surprisingly, that's where it stays, that's a pupa, in the underground chamber for two years. After two years, comes out as an acorn weevil. 
That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down there at the end of that extension. They take those mouth parts and chew a hole into the center of the acorn, then they turn around and lay an egg in that hole and that's how the larva gets down there. Why do they spend two years underground? Why don't they come out the very next year? Well, it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, after the acorn weevil leaves the acorn, it leaves a hole, kind of like a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she spelled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils after they've left the acorns. And if scouts find a new hole in a new acorn, they get all excited because their old acorn's falling apart. So they tell everybody, it's time to, time to move, time to grab the larvae, grab the eggs, move the entire colony into the new, uh, new acorn. That takes about 30 minutes. Then they post a guard to make sure nobody else comes. And that's where they'll live for the next two years until that acorn disintegrates. So what's my point with that little story? That's just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions, largely between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and acorns. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They'll take an acorn, they'll fly up to a mile, although I read not long ago, a mile and a half, a long way from the tree, and then they tap that acorn beneath the soil surface, and the object is they're gonna go back in the winter time and have something to eat. Well, for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. So for every four acorns they bury, and they can bury up to 4,500 acorns. They have planted three oak trees, and that's what oaks depend on for their dispersal, jays. Uh, pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants, specialized interaction there. That's what they rear their young on, carpenter ants. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have a lot of carpenter ants, and you won't have a lot of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have facilia. That is the only plant, the only pollen that that bee can rear its young on. And it turns out pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees in this country, and over a third of them, so you know, well over 1,000 species, can only reproduce in the pollen of particular plants. You won't have the Baltimore checker spot unless you have white turtle head. I could talk all day, all week, all year about nature's specialized relationships. The point I want to make today, though, is that these relationships, nature itself, is, is on the ropes today. And it's on the ropes because we didn't take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. We didn't leave it as it was. There's only about 5% of the lower 48 states that's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition, and those are typically mountaintops. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it, we have drained it, we have grazed it. Got 770 million acres of rangeland out there. That's four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle. And of course, we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We've straightened our rivers and dammed them. You could spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We have drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated from other remnants to sustain the amount of nature that we humans need, because it's nature that keeps us alive on this planet. So you might wonder why we've done this. <clears throat> I wonder why we've done this, and I don't know, but I suspect that we thought that our nest, planet Earth, was so large we could foul it forever, and there wouldn't be any consequences. Uh, but of course we were wrong about that, and that's why we're seeing some pretty scary headlines these days, like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? We're talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America has lost three billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. A third of our North American bird population, already gone. Not a prediction. This is a prediction. The UN says we're going to lose a million species to extinction in the next 20 years, and they said it two years ago, so now it's the next 18 years. Uh, makes a nice headline, but it's not an option, folks. These are the species that keep us alive on the planet. It is time we took this serious, seriously and made sure that it didn't happen. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, thus upon all of our houses, but that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, people like you and, and me, 
but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here, what does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, back to E.O. Wilson. He told us what it would mean if Earth lost its insects, and he did it way back in 1987 with this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. And again, his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our vertebrate animals, our amphibians, our reptiles, our birds, our mammals, those food webs would collapse and all those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is some good news here, uh, and that is that none of that has to happen. We can save our insects. We can save our birds. We can save nature itself. But we're going to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on the life support that ecosystems provide. We call them ecosystem services. <clears throat> Here are just a few things that plants do that we depend on every day, like the production of oxygen, like clean water. Plants are cleaning our water and, and slowing its journey to the sea where it becomes too uh, salty to use. Carbon capture, enormously important in today's world. Plants are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, building their tissues out of that carbon. But even more important, they're pumping that, the extra carbon they fix through photosynthesis into the ground through their root system. And once it's in the ground, it's extremely stable. It can stay there for thousands of years. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots have deposited there over the eons. Plants are building topsoil, they're holding it in place, they're preventing floods, they're dampening severe weather, they're converting sunlight into food. If we lose our plants, we're gonna have to eat sunlight, and that will be an IT challenge. What are animals doing for plants? Lots of things, but here's some important ones. Pest control services, keeping eutrophic systems balanced so that our plants are all, aren't all eaten up. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants, they disperse plant seeds. So designing landscapes like that that destroy the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today it's a terrible idea because of those eight billion people that are demanding more and more ecosystem services every day. And of course, every time we add somebody to the planet, we have fewer ecosystem services. That's not a sustainable relationship. We do have parks, we do have preserves. They are doing the best they can but we are also in the sixth great extinction event, so it's obviously not good enough. So what we now need to do is practice conservation outside of parks and preserves on landscapes just like that. Now we have had visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth, and Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is that the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. There have been indigenous groups have been able to do that for long periods, but our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area, going to another area, doing the same thing, not sustainable behavior. But Adel Leopold had a lot of faith in humans. He believed we could, uh, we could um, develop what he called a land ethic. Now, he knew we had to use the land. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things, but he believed we could learn to do them gently enough that we did not destroy local ecosystems. That's what he called the land ethic and he wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he did not write about was developing a land ethic where we actually live. Uh, and I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot live together, cannot coexist in the same place at the same time, that notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, it is still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have recognized it as an option. What I want to argue this afternoon is that not only is living with nature an option, it's now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and practice conservation where there are a lot of people, because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes. Not hang on by a thread, not be a special guest, but thrive. Where should we start? 
Well, back to private property. Most of the country is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. 85.6% of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we don't practice conservation on private property, we're going to fail. Now, when I use the word conservation, I'm not, not using it correctly. We do want to conserve any bits of nature that are left, absolutely. But we've destroyed too much of it. So we have to go beyond conservation and move into restoration. We have to put it back together again. Rebuild those ecosystems that we've dismantled. And before you tell me, well, you're never going to put it back together again exactly the way it was. I know that. But we can reunite enough of those specialized interactions that we talked about earlier in, in the talk to create functional ecosystems again, even if it's not exactly what was on that spot at some point in the past. But in order to do that, we have to start with the building blocks. Not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally, so we have to start with the most powerful groups, and there's two groups we can't do without. One is the flowering plants, and of course the pollinators that allow those plants to, to reproduce. Uh, they are capturing energy from the sun and through photosynthesis, turning it into food. They're turning it into simple sugars and carbohydrates. That is the food that keeps just about all the animals on the planet alive. But that food is in the plants. So if we don't get it to the animals, we don't have any animals. So the food's stored mostly in, in plant leaves. Most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat something else that ate a plant, typically an invertebrate uh, uh, and typically an insect, but not just any insects. It turns out that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, we're going to have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. I'm going to use the Carolina chickadee as an example. That is the chickadee that you have right here in Virginia. Um, it is at our feeders right now eating seed, and we tend to think that that's all chickadees need is seeds. Uh, well, even in the wintertime, only 50% of their diet is seeds. The other 50% is insects and spiders in the wintertime. And in the spring, when it comes time to reproduce, their babies can't eat seeds at all. So that's it, no more seeds. They switch to invertebrates, mostly insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And they are not exceptions. 96% of our, our birds rear their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? I'm sure you can read that. Uh, this is a citizen science project that one of my grad students did a few years ago, Ashley Kennedy. She put out a call to bird photographers around the country and said, please take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they are carrying food to the nest. Send those pictures to me, Ashley. I will identify all the prey items in the beaks of the birds and recreate the nestling diet for as many species of birds in North America as possible. And it was very successful. She got thousands of pictures. Bird photographers love to take pictures of birds. so. They usually don't know why they're doing it, but this was a goal, so they, they, they loved it. Uh, so what you're looking at there is the, a summary of her results. The green bars are the percentage of the nestling diets in the 20 most common bird families in North America that were caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, what would happen if we design landscapes that don't have enough caterpillars in it? Most of our bird species would not be able to successfully reproduce. So something special about caterpillars, what is it? It's actually several things special about caterpillars, and one of them is that they're soft. Forget this guy as if he's a little sausage, the very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is its exoskeleton, it's made of chitin, uh, it's undigestible. And because they're soft, you can stuff the caterpillar down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring it. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough, the beaks like a plunger, just stuff it down there. Um, caterpillars are also relatively large prey atoms. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious, they're very high in fat, very high in protein, very low percentage of, of chitin, of exoskeleton compared to many other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible, and a lot of beetles have sharp edges too. And then finally, uh, caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. And I mention carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, or because I'm a vertebrate, and you're a vertebrate. Birds are vertebrates, and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. We have to get them from plants. Only plants make carotenoids. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. 
Where are the birds getting their carotenoids from? From what they're eating, of course, especially during the breeding season, that is the prey items they're bringing to the nest. But look, carotenoid content is not equally distributed among bird prey items. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars. Far more carotenoids in the caterpillars than in other types of bird prey. Here are the adult caterpillars, the moths and butterflies themselves. They have far fewer carotenoids because when they become adults, they're not eating green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. <laughs> so that study and several others are suggesting that caterpillars are not optional parts of most bird diets. They are essential parts of most bird diets. So let's just say most birds need caterpillars. The next question is, how many do they need? Is one or two enough? One or two a day enough? Well, that's a good question. So let's go back to Carolina chickadees. There's a lot of data on Carolina chickadees. How many chickadees? No. How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars, depending on the number of chicks in the nest, to get them to the point where they leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, after they fledge, the parents continue to feed them a caterpillars another 21 days. And after 21 days, the babies continue to eat caterpillars, but they're doing it on their own, and they're flying around. Nobody's been able to count that. But you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars required to make one nest of a bird that's a third of an ounce. That's four pennies worth of bird. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and I would think you do because in so many places, it's all we have is our yards. You have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because the chickadees forage about 50 meters for the nest. They are not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And that is true for most of the birds that are out there. They forage very locally to the nest. And if we landscape in a way that does not include all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is one of the major causes of the bird declines that people are measuring. We went to the Rosenberg et al. study. That's a Smithsonian group that said we've lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial bird species in North America into two groups. The species that require insects, at some point in their life history, typically when they're breeding, uh, and the species that do not require insects uh, ever in their life. So things like doves and finches um, can actually make a milk out of seeds, and that's what they feed their, their young. So they don't require insects. And look, the ones that don't require insects didn't lose any numbers over the last 50 years. Good news. But the birds that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. That doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest that as you take away bird food, you lose the birds. So I think we need to raise the bar about what we're asking our landscapes to do. In the past, we've asked them to do one thing, be pretty. And we don't have to give that up. But now they have to be pretty and ecologically functional at the same time. Or we're going to lose ecological function, not an option. Uh, but you're not going to you're not going to have ecologically functional landscapes unless you add caterpillars to those landscapes. So how do you add caterpillars to landscapes? You add caterpillars by adding the plants that support those caterpillars. And that seems easy enough, but there is a catch, and that is that most plants do not support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about it. We have to be fussy about which plants we choose for our landscapes, and we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are fussy about it. And the monarch butterfly illustrates that perfectly. Nothing special about the monarch. It's just I use that as an example because everybody knows a monarch. And everybody knows that you can landscape with all the burning bush and all the barberry and all the calorie pear and all the boxwood and all the ginkgos and all the hostas and all the things we typically landscape with, and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. The only thing that's going to make a monarch butterfly is one of the milkweed species. That's called host, host plant specialization, and it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat particular plants. Why? Well, plants have made them specialized. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own grief, growth, and reproduction. So they do their best to protect themselves from all the insects of the world. They load their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And in a few, well, not long, a couple, couple weeks from now, you can go out, eat a leaf, see if you like it. <laughs> I don't care which leaf you eat, you're not going to like it. Uh, it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world, which is why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. 
There's a reason it, it's hard to get our kids to eat their vegetables. They inherently know they're toxic. <laughs> but insects do eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? <clears throat> well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants can only eat particular plants. They can only eat the plants for which they have specialized adaptations. Specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize their exposure to those compounds. But it takes a long period of evolutionary history with those plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do fall into place, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant. So if you take the milkweeds out of your yard and, and replace them with hostas, or daffodils, or anything else, the monarch is not going to be able to develop on hostas or daffodils. It's going to have two choices then. Fly away and find milkweed someplace else, or starve to death. And that's true for all. 90% of the insects on your, on your property. They have to have the plants that they co-evolved with. This is actually pretty simple. There are three types of plants out there. Plants that contribute energy to local food webs, plants that do not contribute energy to local food webs, and plants that actively take away energy from local food, food webs. Best example of a contributor would be one of the oaks, and this is true across the country. Oaks are contributing more energy to food webs than any other type of, of plant. Good example of a non-contributor would be uh, ginkgo. Ginkgo biloba from Asia. It's a, you know, it's a pretty tree, nice fall color. Nothing eats a ginkgo, so it's not contributing any energy to local food webs. And a great example of a detractor, something that's removing energy from local food webs, would be a calorie pear, or breadfruit pear, or barberry, or burning bush, or porcelain berry, or any of the invasive ornamentals that we have unleashed upon the environment. I mean, that's what they do. Not only are they not, um, not only can our insects not eat them, but they displace the native plants that our insects do depend on. And in, in what, two weeks, one week, you'll be able to see this. When you see white out there, that's where the calorie pear is. None of them were planted, they all escaped from our yards. <clears throat> so, that's my simple message. Plant choice matters. We are not going to restore functional ecosystems if we don't restore the food webs in those ecosystems and you're not going to do that unless you choose the right plants and i'm going to give you three examples of how well it works when you do choose the right plants starting with uh, my house right here in oxford pennsylvania my wife reminds me i should say our house because <laughs> she does live there too um, that's what it looked like when we moved in in the year 2000 it was a farm that was broken up into 10 acre lots uh, and it had been mowed for hay before they broke it up. And then they stopped mowing three years before we moved in. In that three years, you know, when you mow for hay in southeast Pennsylvania, you're mowing autumn olive and multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and all those. Because it goes to the mushroom industry. They call it hay, but it's really chopped up uh, invasive. So when you stop mowing, that's what you give out. Those, you never, the mowing does not kill the rootstock. So it was 10 acres of Sleeping Beauty's castle. I mean, it, you couldn't even walk. But we wanted to restore the food web on this property. So the first thing we did, we knew we had to get rid of those in invasives. Uh, and I wanted to see if I could get some caterpillars to make a living at our house. What were we going to put back there? So one of the early ones I tried was the Canadian owlet. I had never seen a Canadian owlet before. Uh, that's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. And people say, why did you choose a Canadian owlet? Well, I went through Dave Wagner's Caterpillars of Eastern North America. I said, that's a pretty one. Let's try that one. Just like the monarch is a specialist on milkweeds, Canadian owls are specialists on meadow rue. We didn't have any meadow rue. I'm sure it was there. The farm we were on had been farmed almost, four, almost 300 years. I'm sure it was there before agriculture uh, took it all out. So I got some uh, meadow rue seeds. I planted them. It grew very nicely. But this was early on, and I actually had very little faith that Canadian owls would be able to come from who knows where, maybe Canada, and find my little patch of meadow rue. So I didn't even go out and check it. For, it was at least two months after I planted it. But then I was walking by one day and I looked over. There were Canadian outlets all over it. They had found it right away. I'm still impressed with that. So now we've got good population of Canadian outlets and meadow rue. We've added two species to the property that were not there before. Restoration. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. That is a misnomer. A beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on that plant. Biden's aristosa. Ditch daisy. Um, we didn't have any ditch daisy, but I did know where some was, and a power line cut about 14 miles away, 
so I got some seeds, planted them. They did very nicely. As a matter of fact, last summer, they took over my front yard. Um, we had to wait a year for the uh, Goldenrod Stowaway to find my patch of Bidens, but they did, and now we've got a good population of both of those, so now we've added four species to the property. Same with the Hackberry Emperor. We don't have any Hackberry Emperors. Um, wanted that because it belongs there, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world. Um, and as its name suggests, it's a specialist on Hackberry, on Celtus. We didn't have any Hackberry, so I planted Hackberry. I planted about three or four trees of, of Hackberry, I had to wait four years for the Hackberry Emperor to find my Hackberry, but they did, and now we've got a good population of those. So now we've added six species to the property. I did not plant goldenrod. It came in on its own, and along with it came many of the, the specialists on goldenrod, the things that require goldenrod, like the beautiful brown-hooded owlet, the Arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparagonothus, the goldenrod gall moth. Goldenrod supports 110 species of, of caterpillars in our area. I plant a Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. Not just because I'm coming to Virginia, but <laughs> it's a great native plant. I know some people don't like it. I don't know why though. It's got good fall color. It's a great ground cover. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. It makes valuable berries for the birds in the fall. And by valuable, I mean they're high in fat. They're very nutritious. Birds, migrating birds need fat because it's got twice the energy that sugar has. And overwintering birds need fat because they need the energy to, to overwinter. It's also a great pollinator plant, believe it or not. It has tiny little inconspicuous flowers. You don't even know it's in bloom until you see this big cloud of bees around it. When you were planting a pollinator garden, you were planting it for the pollinators. If it's not big and showy for you, that's okay. I plant a Virginia creeper because it's the best host plant for the large sphinx moths, the large caterpillars that are a primary component of cardinal diets, things like the Pandora Sphinx and its beautiful adult, the Lettered Sphinx, the Hog Sphinx, the Abbott Sphinx, all on Virginia Creeper. I want to see if I get the double tooth prominent uh, at our house, just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. Even if you don't like caterpillars, you got to like that guy. He looks like a stegosaurus. <laughs> well, it's a specialist on elm, particularly American elm, and we didn't have any American elm. We lost that decades ago to uh, Dutch elm disease. But there are two big American elms at the University of Delaware that did not die. And every year they make a lot of seeds. So I think the second year after we moved in, I gathered up some of the seeds out of the curb. They were free. They germinate in six days. They grow very quickly. Those trees are now 80 feet tall on my, my property. And yes, they did bring in the double tooth prominent. Another big success, American Elm. Wanted to get the uh, evening primrose moth. They're trying to get the evening primrose moth on our property because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. Well, believe it or not, we didn't have any evening primrose, so I planted that. <clears throat> the moth came, spends a day with its head stuffed in the flowers. Sometimes it's crowded, but it's always very cute. And I planted lots of oaks. Now, those are just examples of the, the plants we put back on our property. But I want to focus on oaks for a while because they are such important plants. That's the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York, Martha Stewart land. Um, people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And I hear all the time, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right. You won't. But if you can enjoy what your oak is contributing to your landscape, particularly your food web, you can enjoy it right away. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, again, free, or two-foot bare root whips, which costs $1.50 each. And immediately, they started to call in the moths that create the caterpillars that run the food web at my house. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow-shouldered moth, Suzuki's promolactus, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow-vested moth, the orange-tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the uh, two-spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red-humped oak worm, the pink-striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the orange pat smoky wing, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the lapper, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come in. <laughs> Thank you for, plant, for clapping for the oaks, because they really are the very best plants. They come in right away. This is the pin oak that just popped its head above the leaves, and there's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that tree. You don't have to wait decades or hundreds of years for your oak to start to contribute to the life around you. They will contribute the very first year. That's what our, our uh, yard looks like from the same place I took that original picture. That's where the Bidens colonized last year. 
uh, but we, we put plants back. Not all of them. I mean, you know, I'm adding them as I get a chance. Uh, but, you know, as I add them, the deer take them away. So it's a, it's a battle. But um, my research over the last 20 years has shown that the number of moth species in your yard, the number of moth species in your local food web is a great index of the value of that food web, how productive it is and, and how stable it is. So five years ago, I took on the challenge of trying to get a picture of every species of moth that is now making a living at our house because we put the plants back. And I am up to 1,199 species of moths. Diversity that is there because we put the plants back. Now we have, we have 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres, so one 240 thousandths of the land mass, we've got 44% of the moths that occur in the entire state. And because so many of them are types of bird food, we've recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Working on number 61, there's a barred owl pair that has been there all winter long. I gotta find that nest someplace. <laughs> Why am I telling you this? Because this is another, another uh, very depressing headline that we see all the time. The World Wildlife Fund says Earth has lost two-thirds of its wildlife since 1970. But I'm thinking, gee, not at our house. I am convinced we have increased biodiversity by more than two-thirds. It didn't take that long, and it wasn't that hard. We just put the plants back. What would happen if everybody put the plants back? We really could turn these terrible headlines around. But I know what you're thinking. We've got 10 acres. Most people have, have less land than that in, let's say, suburbia. Will it work on smaller properties? That is a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than Cindy and I have. When they move, and they're in the middle of a development, they're surrounded by everybody with the big lawns. When they moved in, their yard was choked with, with armor honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle, another serious invasive. So they got rid of that. They planted 70 species of native plants, put in a water feature that they call a bubbler, and then they sat back and started to count the birds that are using their yard, and they are up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species. Just to compare that to our house, we've only recorded eight warbler species at our house. So does it work on smaller properties? Yes, it does. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago, and I mean in Chicago. Right on the other side of that wall there is O'Hare Airport. She has one-tenth of an acre three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. And she's not connected to any natural area at all. She's on a tiny little island in Chicago. It's a pretty island because Pam is a native plant landscaper and she knows what she's doing. Uh, and what she did was to get rid of her non-native plants, she put in 60 species of native plants, a water feature, and then she sat back and she says, with a glass of wine, <laughs> like you folks, and started to count the birds that are using her yard. And she's up to 124 species. They've used her yard on her one-tenth of an acre, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. Every time she finds a new bird, she sends me a picture of it. So, <laughs> so if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house in Chicago. All right, there's four things we need to think about if we're going to succeed in a big way. Uh, and the first one is a big one. It's reducing the area we have in lawn. We have now, we have about 44 million acres of lawn, which is an area bigger than New England dedicated to an ecological deadscape. And you know why we do this. It is a status symbol. And we need to display our Halloween decorations. <laughs> but what if we were to cut the area of lawn in half? Now notice, I'm not saying get rid of lawn. It is a cue for care, it's part of our culture. Let's just reduce the area, cut the area in half. What if we take landscapes like this and turn them into this. I got this picture from Dan Getman uh, in Missouri. I haven't met Dan, but he had this big lawn and he said, he said, look, I'm doing it. I'm putting the plants back. And here's a picture. I said, great. Well, let's make the mass symbol. Let's say we've got 40 million acres of lawn. We're gonna cut that in half. That'll give us 20 million acres we can put towards conservation right where we live. We could build a new national park that I'm calling Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks plus Yellowstone plus Yosemite plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badland National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You add up all this park, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park be the biggest park in the country. What do we get when we put a park at home? What do we get when we have some part of, of nature right where we live? We get the opportunity to interact with it, to develop a personal relationship with it. 
with the mother nature that's keeping us alive. All you have to do is, is go outside. You can do this at your own time, your own pace. Maybe all you have to do is look out the window. You can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, 375 million people there last year with you, so you know what you're going to interact with. It's free. There's no admission fee. It's never closed no matter what pandemic comes down the pike. You can avoid travel hassles, which for me is a biggie. Uh, you can experience the natural world alone. Alone is the key here. You can't get a personal relationship with Mother Nature if it's mediated by somebody else. And this is particularly important for our poor kids who are suffering from nature deficit disorder, according to Richard Louvre. So we're trying. We get 30 kids, put them on a bus with a teacher. They drive for an hour to go to a natural area. They walk around for an hour. Teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back in the bus and they go home. And that's their experience with the natural world which I'm sure is better than nothing, but it's really been an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some bit of nature right where they live, all they have to do is go outside and get to know it. Fall in love with it. Learn how to take care of it alone. No parental supervision. They will come home again. When we hover over our kids, we are sending the message that this is dangerous. Even if we never voice that, we are sending the message, you are not capable of dealing with this highly dangerous thing, nature. Bad message to send to the future stewards of our planet. If they don't love stewarding, if they don't know how to steward, if they don't know their stewards, they're going to be lousy stewards. And we can't afford any more lousy stewardship. And maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii on a very modest patch of nature. A little piece of lawn and a hedge. Uh, but there are no lizards there. And we just... She discovered that. She sent me this picture to describe how you hunt lizards. You get on the ground, and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards can't see you coming. And you crawl slowly towards the lizard. No smiling. This is serious business. You can wear your best dress. That's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard. You catch the lizard. You put it in an aquarium. You learn how to take care of the lizard, hopefully, before the lizard dies. <clears throat> you fall in love with that bit of nature. Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be crawling on the ground the rest of her life catching lizards in her best dress. I don't think. She sent me this picture, so who knows. But I guarantee she's going to remember those experiences in Hawaii, and I guarantee it's going to help her be a good steward of the planet. If you want your kids to do more than catch lizards, get Nancy Stranisti's Nature Play at Home. Dozens of examples of, of how to expose kids to nature right where they live. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, you can do it now. Sorry for the overexposure. This is a very enthusiastic projector here. Um, go to our website, homegrownnationalpark.org, and get yourself on the map. You register your property for free and the amount of area of your property that you're going to be a good steward of. It's kind of like a pledge. You don't have to have completed this. Maybe you really are going to cut the area of lawn in half. Maybe you're going to decrease it by five square feet. That's okay. Maybe you're going to plant an oak tree. Maybe you're going to put an, an aster in a flower pot. It all counts. You record that, and then your little piece of your county is going to light up. You'll get to see where everybody else in your county has joined Homegrown National Park. And the object is to get the message that everybody, not just tree huggers, is a critical component of the future of conservation. We want that message to go viral. We want to light up the entire country. What are we asking? We do want people to reduce the area of lawn. Lawn is a, it's a, just a terrible waste, an ecological waste of real estate. Uh, and replace it with more natives, yes. Remove the invasives that are on our properties. Most of us have invasive plants on our properties, either as ornamentals or in the edges of our properties that we never actually clean out. They're producing seeds that continue this, you know, this bad circle. Yeah. Um, so we want to remove the invasive. Remember, if we, if we own 85% of the, of the country east of the Mississippi, if everybody got rid of the invasives on their property, we'd be 85% done. It's your responsibility. If you're protecting any natural areas on your property, yes, we want to keep, keep protecting those, those areas. We have ecological products, significant increase in biodiversity. That's certainly what we've seen at, at our house. A measurable reduction in invasive species. Yeah, we've seen that at our house too, and you can see it as well. You just get rid of them. If you turn your lawn into something like that, there's a significant drawdown of carbon dioxide. Lawn is the worst carbon sequester out of all plant po possibilities. What we're doing is transforming areas outside of parks and preserves into viable habitat, which eventually will create connectivity between our parks and preserves and go a long way to increasing uh, the sustainability of our biodiversity.
There's a sociological product as well, national awareness, not just of what the problem is, but what the solution is. We want to change the culture. We want people to recognize that nature is not, it's not optional. It's not there just for our entertainment. It's essential, and we all have a responsibility to, to stewarding it. We want to convert hope into action. Hope is great, but action's even better. Uh, and it's going to merge existing conservation organizations. National Wildlife Federation, Audubon, Wild Ones, Sierra Club, a lot of great groups out there doing great things. If everybody gets on the map, since we're not charging, we're not pulling membership away, we just want to record all the efforts that are happening out there so we have a good measure of what is really being preserved. You know the 3030 initiative? We're going to save 30% of the U.S. by 2030? Not if we don't record what's happening on private property. And I don't see any plan to do that. So let's use the map to do that. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to join Homegrown National Park. What plants should we put in where there was once lawn? I'm going to argue that some of them have to be what I'm calling keystone species. Remember what the keystone is? It's a stone in the middle of the arch. You take that stone out of the arch, and the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants, the keystone plants, are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that are holding up that house. They're the support, they're essential. You cannot build a house out of wallpaper, even though we've been trying to do that for the last 100 years. So the question is no longer simply, are native plants ecologically better than non-native plants? On average, they certainly are. Uh, but there's a lot of native plants that aren't contributing all that much either. So the question really is, do we want to use the most powerful plants, the biggest contributors, the ones supporting the most pollinators and the most caterpillars, or not? What is supporting the most caterpillars? It's one of the oak trees. Uh, in 84% of the counties in which they occur, they are the top keystone plant across the country. They support 557 species of caterpillars in the mid-Atlantic state, over 950 species nationwide, although we are on the verge of adding more than 100 new host records, so it's going to be more than 1,000 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. If you want to know what the top plants are in your county, you go to Native Plant Finder on the National Wildlife uh, Federation website, put in your zip code, and the rank list of both the woody um, plants and the herbaceous plants in your county that are best at supporting those caterpillars will pop up for your county. That's just an abbreviated list. This is just an example uh, of how to do it. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to invite a lot of insects to our yard, and then we're going to kill them with our security light, which, of course, is not the goal. <clears throat> There's a lot of research that is showing that, that uh, night, light pollution at night is one of the major um, causes of insect decline, uh, not just in this country, but in Europe as well. These are all the ways that lights are killing our insects, particularly those moths that create the caterpillars that run, run the food web. This is actually um, good news to me. We have got to turn around insect decline. We've already lost more than 45% of the insects on the planet. If we can do that by flicking a switch, we're getting off easy. There's a lot of switches to flick, but it's easy. But I know what you're going to say. Well, I cannot turn the light out over my barn, or over my garage, or over my front porch, because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on it so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you will recognize is the bad man does not come very often. And if you don't want to do that, even easier, take the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb, yellow LED, yellow uh, incandescent. You can get them at your hardware store now. Yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to nocturnal insects than our white or blue wavelengths. If we were to switch out our white, white lights for yellow lights overnight, we would save millions of insects. And if we use LEDs, millions of dollars too. So we're going to shrink the lawn, we're going to put in keystone plants, we're going to modify our light system, then we're going to invite a mosquito fogger to come kill all of our insects. And I mean all of our insects. They say it's okay, because what we're fogging is a natural product. And it is. It's pyrethroids. That's the compound in, in chrysanthemum. It's industrial strength pyrethroids, but it's a natural product. I don't like that argument. Cyanide is a natural product. Ricin is a natural product. Some of the most deadly things we've ever encountered are natural products. So that, that's not working for me. They also say it only kills mosquitoes. I wish that was correct. They kill all the insects that they come in contact with, which is all the insects, including all the pollinators we just tried to restore, including those monarch populations. Two years ago, big monarch killed when they flew through Mosquito Joe, hundreds of dead monarchs on the ground. 
The interesting thing is it doesn't control mosquitoes. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. It is too hard. You have to kill 90% of the adult mosquitoes to actually get control. Mosquito Joe kills between 10 and 50%, so it's not even close to, to actually working. If you really want to control mosquitoes, let's use biocontrol. Let's use Bacillus thuringiensis in the form of mosquito dunks. You get a bucket, you fill it full of water, you put in uh, a handful of straw or hay or, or probably dead grass or dead leaves, some organic matter that will stimulate the growth of algae and diatoms. That is what mosquito larvae eat. It becomes an irresistible brew to adult mosquitoes that want to lay their eggs, and they'll lay their eggs in your bucket. They will come from all over to lay your eggs in your, in your bucket. Then you go to the hardware store and you get a sheet of mosquito dunks, $9, $12. Put in a mosquito dunk, uh, and the larvae hatch, and they nibble on it, and they die. It's extremely targeted. It only kills aquatic diptera, and the only aquatic diptera in your bucket is mosquito larvae. So if a dragonfly gets in there, it's not going to hurt it. If your dog drinks it, it's not going to hurt it. You might put a coarse screen over it so your local chipmunk doesn't commit suicide, <laughs> which they seem to like to do. But it's targeted, it's cheap. If everybody did it, it would actually control mosquitoes without killing anything else. But without killing anything else, I mean, if you really want to kill anything and you want to use your yard some summer evening, get a fan and plug it in. It creates a, a breeze. The mosquitoes don't fly into that. That works. All right, fourth thing we need to do is to landscape in a way that allows caterpillars to complete their development. We're just starting to think about this now, but now this is an example. I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from one of the branches, then it emerges as an adult, and then it does it all over again. Everything happens on the tree. And I wish everything happened on all the trees everywhere, but they don't. Caterpillars typically finish growing on trees and then they drop from the tree. Most of the caterpillars drop from the tree and try to pupate underground. They'll wiggle their way under the ground and they'll make a pupa underground or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. We don't tolerate it, it's messy. And we mow and compact the area under the trees so that it's rock hard, particularly in the, in the summertime when these caterpillars are trying to get underground. This becomes an ecological trap. If we plant the right plants and the moths come in, lay their eggs, caterpillars develop and then drop down and die, that's not going to help anything. And of course, the cement landscape is, is not the answer either. I've got a new grad student now who is looking at how well caterpillars do in a typical situation like this, but I guarantee they're going to do better in a layered landscape like this, where you have a tree and maybe a dogwood and maybe azalea, ferns, ground cover. There's, there's leaf litter in there, or there should be. The ground is not compacted. So far, the data suggests that's the major factor. It's compacted. They cannot get underground. So it's not compacted. Nobody's going to mow them. Nobody's going to step on them. Much higher survivorship. This is where you can do your fancy spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink the lawn, folks. You put big beds around your trees. The bigger, the better. Your trees will love it, and it'll be a safe, soft landing for all those caterpillars. Use your uh, native ground covers liberally, like wild ginger. Uh, this is uh, native pachysandra, there's Virginia creeper, golden seal, may apple, foam flower, ferns, a lot of choices there. If you can see the ground, you don't have enough plants on the ground. I mean, people say, what's the best mulch? Living mulch is the best mulch. Your trees will love it, and so will the caterpillars. How do you create those beds when you've got a big lawn? Start with leaves in the fall. Rake them to where your bed's going to be. That's going to be a big one. If you don't have enough, when your neighbors put out their leaves as if they're garbage, go get the bags and take them to your house. You do want to smother the lawn, then you can plant right through it. So it's, try not to dig up the grass because you're losing a lot of topsoil when you do that. Okay, another former grad student, Desiree Narango, did uh, some wonderful work with um, uh, Carolina Chickadee right here, right inside the beltway of, of DC. Um, and her, the results of her study suggest there's actually room for compromise in our plant choices. She had one simple question. She said, uh, in residential landscapes, the really urban landscapes, how well do chickadees do when the landscape is dominated by native plants versus non-native plants? When they're dominated by non-native plants, they produce 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, you've reduced the amount of bird food by 75%. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. All the, the landscapes, all the houses had uh, nest boxes up, but the chickadees would come and look around and say, there's not enough food here, we're not even going to try to breed. 
If they did try to breed, those, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. If you put all that information into a population growth model as a function of the amount of non-native woody plant biomass you have in your, your yard, uh, this is what you get from none to 100% here. We looked at woody plants because that's where chickadees forage. They're not foraging on the ground. They're on woody plants. This dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. Chickadees don't live that long. If you breed at that rate, you have a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, anything above this line, you've got a growing population. And that's what happens when you have very few non-native plants. But if you make fewer babies than adults die, you have an unsustainable shrinking population and it's shrinking. So right here is where those lines inter intersect, liberally speaking, which means you can have up to 30% of the plants in your landscape non-native without destroying the local food web. That's where we're going with this. Now, none of them can be invasive because, you know, they're ecological tumors. I get an e email that said, well, you know, can I have just like a few tumors in my ecosystem? How many tumors do you want in your body? <laughs> it doesn't stay a few. That's the problem. Remember Dan Getman? That's a ginkgo there. Why does Dan have a ginkgo in his, in his uh, native landscape? Because Dan's wife likes ginkgos, and she said, Dan, please plant a ginkgo, and he did. Is that plant destroying the functionality of his new native plant landscape? No. Is it going to escape and become an invasive species? No. It's just there. So I like to think of plants that are just there doing nothing as they're like statues. Now, if every one of Dan's plants was a statue, you know, it obviously wouldn't work. It's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of those contributors. So if we increase the, the really powerful plants in our landscapes, we can, we can tolerate non-natives that are not invasive. Can we use native plants uh, in formal designs? Of course we can. This is a Lynn O'Shaughnessy design taken from a drone 400 feet up. You don't get more formal than that, and every plant in that landscape is a native plant. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe every day. And that's okay, because I guess they're not native plants over there. Can we get a, a uh, pollinator garden into a residential landscape like this without offending anybody? Of course we can, just put a little fence around it. It formalizes it. It tells our neighbors that this is not just a bunch of weeds we forgot to mow. And that's okay. It's the message that we're letting the landscape go that people don't like. It's pretty when it's in bloom. It's meeting the needs of, of several of our bees. It's not very big, but if everybody did it, it would help. Help what? Help our pollinators. Why do we need pollinators? You will hear every day you need them because they pollinate a third of our crops. It's actually about a twelfth of our crops. And I hear people say, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. That's why I don't like the agriculture argument. We need pollinators and we need them everywhere because they're pollinating 80% of all plants, not just our crops, and 90% of all flowering plants. So forget the crop argument, we need pollinators. How about this, a Drew Latham design, much bigger. Imagine the life supported there, amount of life that's supported there versus the amount of life support over here. Seems like a no-brainer. Can municipalities help with live with nature? Yes, they can. More and more of them are doing it. Minnesota has a cost-sharing program where they're paying residents to reduce or replace their lawn with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. It's been in operation for years, it's very popular. Pennsylvania's got a new program uh, very similar to that. There's an island off of Florida that's paying people to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written, I think. Uh, if you have an endangered species on your property, we're gonna pay you to take care of it rather than fine you if you use your property. Everybody would want an endangered species. Put a, put a bounty on these invasive ornamentals like calorie repair. That's what St. Louis, Missouri did, Fayetteville, Arkansas. South Carolina has banned them all together. I think, I think Maryland's banned them too. I don't know about Virginia. Um, North Carolina has a bounty on You take out a calorie repair, you get a free tree replacement. Water utility is giving people $100 coupons to use water uh, efficient native plants. And of course, the big lawn re replacement programs in California. This has gone up. You now get $3 rebate for every square foot of lawn that you take 
take out. California's getting little rain right now, but that's not going to last. They can't. They don't have one drop to waste on on water. And if you want more information on all of those programs, just memorize that. <laughs> all right. I think we made three missteps in the early years of conservation, and the first one's serious. We're starting to think of nature as if it's optional. We like it. It entertains us. We like to ride our bikes in it. We like to to, to walk in it. Uh, but it's not essential, and if it's not essential, when push comes to shove, when resources are in short supply, nature takes a back seat. And of course, that's always. Resources are always in short supply. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out, and there's this wall-sized poster there, which to me epitomizes our society's view of conservation. We want to save wildlife, we want to save nature so that future generations can enjoy it. It was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for expanding the national park system. We want to save these beautiful places so that future generations can enjoy them. I get that. Nature is enormously entertaining, but it's far more than that. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. If we start thinking about that, it will be really a no-brainer that we have to put some resources toward this. And we've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. We've talked about that. If we can find conservation just to the area where there's not a lot of humans, we're going to fail because there's, those areas are too small, too isolated, and too few. David Quammen has a wonderful analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. That is a functional Persian rug. That's not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that is what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. I don't like that language because it suggests there's places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. There's plenty of places where we've destroyed the ecological significance, but every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides, even including much of our agriculture. So we need to glue our rug back together again, folks. We've got to put the plants back, not just to build biological corridors that connect viable habitat with each other, but to recreate viable habitat in all the places where we've destroyed it. This is starting to happen. This is happening. And when it does happen, it'll be the first time in modern history that humans have coexisted with the natural world. Our third misstep was to, to leave Earth stewardship to just a, a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, a few ecologists. For some reason, we didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of every person on the planet. But I don't know why. Because every single person on the planet depends entirely on the quality of their local ecosystem. So why wouldn't everybody have the responsibility of taking care of that ecosystem? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said, the Western settler mindset is, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with those mindsets, you're taught them. We've been very good at teaching uh, our kids and our, our peers that we all have rights. We've been terrible about teaching the, the message that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. More and more people are recognizing the planet has, has some problems, got some serious problems, but they all feel powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn, one person can use keystone plants, one person can put in a pollinator garden, one person can fire mosquito joe, one person can, can uh, put in, did I say, shrink, did we say all the things? <laughs> do all the things I just talked about. Get rid of the invasive plants on your property. One person can do that. One person really can do all of those things. Doesn't have to happen overnight. And it shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire pro Earth's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the planet that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious that's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a park or preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power, and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate, and then ultimately our own. I think I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. I know that's a long talk. Um, so if you gotta go, you gotta go, I get it. But if you wanna ask questions, uh, I will answer them as long as you want to ask them.
Right, right. Yeah, so can you, can you essentially recycle those, those invasives you pull out? You know, it depends on what the species is. Uh, for many of them, absolutely. They break down very quickly, uh, particularly if you pull them out when they're not in seed. January is a great time to fight invasives. You put your heavy coat on, they can't even stab you. <laughs> but something like uh, Japanese knotweed, which grows along our streams, you know, a piece the size of your pinky nail will start a new plant. So that, you've got to be a little bit more careful with that. You don't want to plant that all, or just lay it all over the place because um, that could take root. I like to make big piles, you know, big piles of bodies. It makes it look like you've really accomplished something. Um, so just with that, with, you know, with a few uh, caveats, it's, it's fine to do that. Yes? I would love a book, a coffee book of your photos, like matching the animals with the plants. I think that would be a great fundraiser or way to make money because they're so beautiful. Your photos are amazing. So I have the plants and then what's eating them. Yeah. You know, that's kind of what's on that native plant finder. You put in the plant, it go backward too. It won't just tell you how many you're eating, it'll tell you what is eating it if you go, go backwards. It's, you know, it needs to be better populated with, with pictures. We need more people helping us do this. <laughs> <laughs> but your photos but, are great, so they're no, really inspirational. Oh, thank you, but you know what, it's, it's my subjects that are great, so. Anybody else, yes? That's the way my father built it, and that's the way my grandfather built it, and <laughs> that's what you're stuck with. Uh, but is there a, a way to make inroads in that area? Yes, refuse to buy a house that's landscaped like that. They're doing it because they think, it, first of all, it's cheaper for them, um, and they think that's what we've always bought, that's what we've wanted. It's the old cookie cutter, dead landscape that has prevailed for the last hundred years. So there are, there is movement in that direction. Every once in a while I meet a developer who's actually, um, really is a green developer. It's not just the developers, it's the real estate um, groups that make people. When we, Cindy and I used to live in Westchester, uh, Pennsylvania, when we moved to Oxford, uh, we, we hired a real estate agent, first thing she said was, you know, get rid of all these plants, you've got to create some, some curb appeal. We, we fired her. But that, you know, that, I mean, it's got to be, it's got to be just like everybody else's or it's not going to sell. Uh, that's not true either anymore. You know, big oak tree in a plant, in a tree, in a yard increases the value of that yard many thousands of dollars. People like that stuff and there's more and more people that are looking for these types of landscapes. It's not mainstream yet but it's headed in that direction. So it's all a matter of markets. The developers, when they realize, gotta be native or it's not gonna sell, that'll do it. Now you can do top-down regulation, and many places are doing that, saying these tre landscape trees you put in do have to be native. I'm seeing that more and more. Uh, but they still, yeah, still have the big lawn. And, uh, so we have a ways to go, but you're right. Developers are setting the stage, and then everybody's gotta fix it. If we started with it done to begin with, we'd be done. So you talked a lot about the oak tree, and I have a very small house in Arlington, and definitely not room for an oak tree. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, very small house, very small yard. Do you have a second best to the oak? Well, here, here's the ranking. You know, oaks are best, uh, prunus and native willows, so something like black cherry, um, native willows, a little smaller than oaks, but not, not really small. Birches, um, poplars, uh, hickories, they're mostly the big big trees, but consider Quercus crinoides, dwarf chestnut oak. It makes acorns when it's five feet tall. I'll bet you can get one in your little yard. Can Just you say that one again? Quercus crinoides, dwarf chestnut oak. And I have a question about oaks again. I'm sorry. Who's talking? Oh, about? Oh, okay. oh. <laughs> Hello. Um, uh, the presence of uh, the f a mushroom, Amelaria melea, um, in, in your yard uh, is causing uh, like the, the oak trees um, to decline. Um, and I was wondering if 
that present is going to condemn every oak tree that I will try planting in the yard. Uh, I don't know if you understood. That yeah, yeah, I did. Yes. Um, a couple issues here. We do have some serious oak diseases. We've got oak wilt and we've got bacterial leaf scorch and they are killing a lot of our oaks. And you're hearing the recommendation, don't plant any oaks because they're all going to die. That's not an option. What we have to do is find the resistant genotypes and there are resistant genotypes for those diseases. So now is the time to plant more oaks than ever. But we also have arborists that are going around and if they see the mushroom or if they see a little hollow spot near oak, which is totally natural, they'll tell you to cut it down. When somebody is going to make money off of their own advice, think twice about it. Oaks, the, you know, oaks can live, the average age of an oak is 900 years. No, ours never get there because we do all these things to them. They always get hollow on the inside. So uh, that's dead xylem. People say, then it's really weak. No, a pipe is hollow, but it's really strong. The living portion of the oak is on the, on the outside. So oaks do die and occasionally they, they drop branches and things. The mushroom could be growing on any organic matter, maybe an old root system that has nothing to do with that oak. It might be associated with your oak, but don't do anything until your oak is really on its last legs. And if it, let's say it fell, if it's so far from your house it wouldn't cause any problems, don't do anything anytime. There are 85 species that depend on tree holes for nesting, 85 bird species, uh, and yet we never give them the, the snags for, for tree holes. That's my little rant about that. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, yes, I would like to know, I heard, I've actually have 20 flower gardens and I dug the grass up and you said that's not the best way to remove grass because... Well, it's I'm the hardest way. It's the hardest way to remove grass. Okay, but what's the best way? Smother it. The object is to keep all of the soil that that grass is growing there. Now, if you have a, you know, a whole bunch of, of topsoil, Digging up will get rid of it. Um, the professionals will spray. Um, so, you know, a lot of people say, I don't want to do that, but you have to kill the grass or it's going to compete in a serious way. You'll be weeding it out for the rest of your life. Um, so it's, it's up to you how you, how you do it. But um, smothering it is the, um, it's the least toxic way to do it. Let me just say a word about, about pesticides. Uh, because it's very controversial, I know, and you read about all the, all the people who are suing um, Roundup companies because they're all going to get cancer. Herbicides are a tool in our ecological toolbox. They have to be used correctly. They can't be overused. They are used incorrectly and are overused every single day. That's the problem. But if we don't kill the root system of our invasives, you have them forever. So it's a, it's a, uh, it's a cost-benefit analysis. Is, is saying I'm not gonna use Roundup and it's okay to have your total ecosystem covered with calorie pear. I say no, the cost of Roundup is far less than, than allowing these things to continue. So what I do is I, I paint, I don't spray because you always hit non targets, cut it off at the base and, and paint actually just the outer rim of your, your stump. I've been meaning for years to take a soil sample next to a painted stump uh, and see how much of that is actually there. I've never, never done it. But you're using very little material and you've killed the root system. So when we moved into our house, there were oriental bittersweet vines that big. And I, we signed the papers the same day I ran out there and I sawed them off at the base and I did not treat them with anything. I didn't want to use herbicides either. That was 22 years ago. We are still fighting the bittersweet that's coming up from those giant root systems that we did not kill. If I had killed it, that day, it would have been it would have been done. So there's a real cost to trying to do it without killing them. And some of those things, like like uh, autumn olive, like uh, oriental bittersweet, like porcelain berry, really really tough to kill without herbicide. And Japanese stilt grass. Don't ask me. <laughs> we need a disease to fight that guy. So. Yes. Um, oh, right here. Um, how do you feel about like native cultivars? Yeah, cultivars. That used to be the most common question I, I got. Um, if you go to the store and you say, I want to buy a native plant, chances are really good it's going to be a cultivar of a straight species uh, because the nursery industry has been built on the idea that plants are decorations only and they're just adjusting to the new demand that we actually want to buy a plant for its ecological value. Um, 
they don't really believe that. So all the plants that are there have been selected for a particularly uh, beautiful trait. Maybe it's got redder leaves in the fall. Um, and that's what's available. So the question is, are they ecologically as powerful as the straight species? And we did a, we did a study looking at woody plants and not the flowers, but is a tall plant as good as a short plant? When you take a green leaf and you make it red or purple, is that as good? Uh, when you enhance berry size over the winter, six different traits uh, and compared common garden experiment for three years, compared insect use. The only one that consistently reduced insect use was taking a green leaf and making it red or purple because that loads the leaves with anthocyanins, which are uh, feeding deterrents. But the others didn't, didn't make any difference. So the, so the answer is, it depends on what the cultivar trait was. Now, Annie White has looked at cultivars of flowers up in Vermont, and uh, Mount Cuba Center in Hocus and Delaware is doing a lot of very good uh, trial garden experiments with different cultivars. Uh, and again, the answer is, it depends, but when you change flower size and shape and color, the chances that you mess up the relationship with specialized pollinators is far greater because they're specialized on the shape and flower and UV spectrum of the flower, the, the nutrition of the pollen, the pollen shape, all of those things that can be changed when we start fooling with, with flowers. Uh, sometimes it, it increases the value. And a lot of these, these cultivars, by the way, are, are natural variants found in nature and we just put names on them. So Phlox paniculatum jenna was found in Georgia. It's got twice the number of flowers as the straight species and it has twice the number of butterflies. So, so you can't say, well, that's going to happen with every cultivar. No, but it does happen occasionally. So it's, it's an it, it depends situation. One thing I don't like about cultivars, though, is they're typically uh, propagated clonally, which means there's zero genetic variability. And we know that particularly in today's world of climate change, we need as much genetic variability as possible so these plants can adapt to those crazy changes we're throwing at them. Um, thanks for that. I had more of a comment just for a caution if people are buying at nurseries where they sell cultivars, they should be also checking with those nurseries to make sure that they are not grown with neonicotinoids. Yeah, neonics. Neonicotinoids, 7,000 times more toxic than DDT was to insects. Neonicotinoids, um, imidacloprid. <laughs> the seed conings, when you buy a seed and it's pink, that's neonics. 5% is taken up by the plant, 95% washes off or blows off, and it's around. Thank you. Hi. Uh, we have purchased a property a few years ago, but it had bamboo. It has bamboo on it. Any suggestions? <laughs> well, you missed your chance to reduce the price of your property by maybe $100,000. <laughs> uh, bamboo. Banned in Dover, Delaware. I mean, I have, I have, there's some properties in North Delaware that I have watched. They are totally destroyed. You're going to need serious backhoe work to get rid of that stuff, which, you know, it's the size of this room for these great big guys. Suggestions. Um, you've got you to kill it. Uh, you, can, you can chainsaw each stem and paint it, as I suggested. People really are getting backhoes. Terrible problem. It's the fact that we, we still sell them in our nurseries is it's just criminal. Good luck. I'm sorry. <laughs> and keep it away from your neighbors because neighbors are starting to sue them for that because it just keeps going. You know. Yeah? Um, I'd love for if, if you could, you mentioned it a little bit, if you could talk about how you avoided deer eating all your native plants, because it's a big heartbreaker, you plant them and the deer eat yeah. all of them, yeah. or everything is all caged up, and yeah. when can the cages go away? Well, the cages can go away, all right, that's how I avoided it, I put a cage around everything I wanted to keep. I have to get permission from our deer to drive out of the driveway. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, deer... The reason we have such a problem with invasive plants is not because these are super plants, it's because the deer eat everything but them. So it's the only thing left. Our natives are actually quite competitive if they're not eaten when they're two inches tall by the overabundance of deer from here to California. It is devastating our forests. It's created the Lyme disease issue, um, getting rid of our ground breeding birds. There are big problems with, with too many deer. 
so how do I do it? Yeah, I get the, the wire cages from Home Depot or Lowe's, they're about five feet tall. Uh, and uh, well, I see people put cages around their trees, but they're small, like the trees like this, you know. It's gonna grow like that forever. You gotta give them room to, to uh, s spread out. You know, the, the acorns I planted 22 years ago are now 60 feet tall, uh, and you know, they've, they've got trunks like this. No deer problem there. Uh, so they do get past it, but I, I call it graduation, when they're tall enough that I can take the cage off without the deer killing the plant. But you have to be careful then, too, with buck rubbing, because the bucks rub the velvet off their antlers on stems that are about this big. Uh, so what I do is, you know, you get the, the plastic deer fencing. It's eight feet tall. I've tried that for a while. I just chop it up and put one little wrapping around that, and that keeps the bucks from, from rubbing it. It's a pain in the neck. Uh, but those, those cages I bought 22 years ago, I'm still using them. Just move them around. But if I don't, it, you know, they, they eat everything, so. Uh, big fan. <laughs> um, but I do have a question. Um, when you're talking about natives, how native? I mean, I'm feeling guilty for planting bottle brush buckeye because they're not native to Fairfax County. Um, but are you like a local ecotype purist? I'm very pure. <laughs> um, that's a good question. That's a good question. I worry about food web functionality. So I'm thinking, if I plant a beech tree where the, the seed came from Florida, because beech go from Canada all the way to Florida, and I plant that in my Pennsylvania yard, and I ended up doing this accidentally because I bought trees from a nursery that had taken seed from the south, and I didn't know it. Um, my beach-eating caterpillars will eat that beach fine, no problem at all. But the first year, they're gonna be a late frost and, it, and it'll kill all the leaves. Um, so I had that happen several years. I had to put blankets over them and everything else. That's provenance. Your, if your tree is way outside of the latitude or the longitude and the altitude that it can stand, it will die. Uh, and then it's not, a, not an issue, it's, it's died. There has been research showing what, you know, some people worry that, oh, if you plant a genotype from outside your local area, it's going to pollute the genes of all the native things. Um, there's no evidence that that ever happens. So people really sh shouldn't worry about that anymore. Is your bottle brush buckeye contributing to your local landscape, even though it's really from Ohio? Well, it makes a lot of nectar. Um, and I've got a picture of five swallowtails on one bloom uh, because they were enjoying the nectar. Uh, so does it really belong there? No. Is it destroying my food web? No. Is it acting like an aggressive invasive? So when we move plants far away from, when we, you know, if you, if you plant a uh, uh, blue spruce, that's from the Colorado Rockies. It's totally separated from its Colorado Rocky ecosystem. Is it contributing much? No. It's, you know, it's kind of like being from China but it's not being invasive or anything. So remember that 30% compromise? You can compromise with native plants too. So I, I am not a purist and I know some people are mad at me for that. <laughs> but part of me is pure, so. <laughs> anything else? Mahonia. Mahonia. Yes. Yeah, yeah well that's, that's like, our it's like Colorado blue spruce. It's so far outside. No, no, no. Really? Into our wild it's moving. Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Yep. Okay, no, no invasives, you know, ecological tumors. <laughs> yeah, okay. That is a good point. That is a good point. I have a question about ground disturbance. So I also moved into the area and we have beautiful trees that have been there, you know, probably 200 years or more. Um, but we have a lot of ivy and I'm afraid of m moving the ivy from the ground, disturbing the roots and planting something when the trees are so established. 
Do you have any thoughts well, on you're that? You're worried about hurting the tree. The, well, the root systems, et cetera, yeah. Um, and then if I'm going to, what you suggested was put some soft landing uh, uh, vegetation for the caterpillars. <laughs> Um, if I do some plants around the tree roots, I didn't know how far I could go before I start damaging the, the ground. So if you could talk about ground disturbance and also mulching. So, so I, I, I'm sure that part of this answer is going to depend on what the species of the tree is that you're talking about. If they've got you know, surface roots and throwing a whole lot of shade, it's going to be hard to get anything going under there. And then just leaf litter might be the best way to go. Uh, I, it's, it's my experience that ivy roots are not very deep and you can, you can get rid of them. It's hard. Ivy's another really tough one without hurting the tree. And I, I would suggest it's a good thing. The tree's going to be very happy that it's not draped with ivy, uh, which it will be if you don't get rid of it eventually. Um, so, uh, you know, if it, were, if it were me, I would get rid of the ivy and I still would plant things. But... When I have planted things next to my trees, I always underestimate how fast those trees are growing and I put it too close to the trunk. So now they're, they're too shaded. I've done that with, with viburnums a number of times. Consider the canopy of that tree getting much bigger than it is now and put them out in the sun so that they'll, they'll be productive plants. Yes? Is the Oh yeah, you don't need a big hole. Is the liquid fence that I spray in my on my native plants to repel the deer also repelling insects? Yeah, that's another comment, a question I get all the time, but nobody's looked at that. I haven't looked at that either. I do know that insects find their host plants uh, by smell. It's through it's through odors floating on the air, you know, essentially plant pheromones, um, and. That's the whole point of those deer spray. They change the smell of the plant. So my guess is it would deter insects, but I don't think it's been studied. So I, I'm too lazy to do that because every time it rains, you've got to go out and do it again. And, you know, if you just have a few prime one, that's that's fine. So yeah. Just a second. Okay, mulch. Um, Bare ground is, is not good. You want to protect the soil community. Uh, and the best way to do that is to maintain the proper moisture level that all of the soil community depends on. That's your mycorrhizae. It's the, it's the, uh, you know, the zillions of little calembola and proturans and all the things that are detritivores breaking down your, the leaves that fall every year to return the nutrients to the soil. They all depend on high humidity. Uh, so that's the function of mulch. In the, the old days, it was leaves that fell off the tree and they stayed right where they fell and that was great. And the nutrients that that tree used this year then returned to the soil and they got to use them again. So when you rake your leaves away, you're taking, your, you're, you're starving your tree if you do that for, forever. Um, but if we go out and we buy bark mulch, which actually pulls uh, uh, nutrients, uh, pulls nitrogen out of the ground. The, the bacteria that break down bark mulch are, are um, Removing nitrogen from the soil, which is not a great idea. To me, the very best leaf litter is the leaves that come from that tree, uh, and then any any living material that you can have over that tree, over those those uh, those leaves. Is it hot? What kind of mulch are you talking about? You mean bark, bark mulch? Is it harmful? Uh, it's not, it's not the best, you know, sometimes it, it gets pretty compacted and you look under there, it's actually really dry under that. It's this, the fung, fungi kind of glue it together and it repels water, then it's, then it's harmful. Um, but bare ground's worse, so I, I agree. <laughs> One more over here. It's been a great experience with my American elm. You mean, why didn't it die? I think she's wondering if, it, if, it, if, it, um, if they become diseased. What is she wondering? <laughs> How do you avoid survival? Thank you. I'm How sorry. have mine survived? 
with the disease problem, with the, disease, with the Dutch right. elm disease. Um, I, can only, I can only guess, and I don't just have one. I have seven or eight, uh, and um, none of them have, have died, and it's been 22 years. Will they die in the next 50 years? Maybe, but you know what happened? It used to be that there were American elms everywhere. Right. All right, so then, so we planted too many of them. The Dutch elm disease came. It's spread by bark beetles. There were huge populations of bark beetles, huge population of the blue stain fungus, and it was easy to get around. That's gone. So it's, you know, there's small populations of the bark beetles. The blue stain fungus is somewhere, I'm sure, hasn't found my, my house yet. Or, remember, those seeds came from trees that didn't die. So maybe there was some natural resistance in them as well. These were not the Princeton elm or the Liberty elm, the ones that, that were actually selected for disease resistance. Uh, so I don't know why they haven't died. But, you know, I, if I had said, if I had asked for advice, should I plant American elm back then, it would have been absolutely not. If they died tomorrow, I've gotten 22 good years of, of use out of them. So uh, I'm very glad I did. But they're not going to die tomorrow. They look great. They've got all their little seeds on there. So. Okay, we're done. Okay. I, <laughs> Round of applause for Doug Talley. So if you didn't get your book signed before the lecture, he'll be out here for a few more minutes. So if you want to make a line, then he'll be out in a second.